Hi, I'm Gail Gitton. I am uh, very involved with the Davis Finney Foundation. I was married for 52 wonderful years with a man who passed away from Parkinson's um, just one year ago. And um, I don't know, I just can't leave the organization because yeah. it did so much for us. And um, it really helped me through some really rough times. So I feel that I want to keep, keep working with them. Pat, why don't you introduce yourself? Well, hi, I'm Pat Donahue. I am uh, the a care partner to my wife, Sydney. We're both ambassadors, like uh, Connie mentioned. And uh, uh, she was diagnosed um, in 2010. And it's been a journey. And it's continuing. And we love it. And hate it. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome, everybody. Go, Gail. Hey, go. one of the things that was said this morning, someone said Parkinson's is predictably unpredictable. I really like that. Yeah. Uh, I call it sometimes it slaps you in the face without you knowing it's coming. Yeah, no, yeah. that's... That's true. And I mean, you just lay some plans down and then all of a sudden, uh, you know, you got to just uh, call an audible, as they say in football parlance. And since it's color, uh, you know, college football day, we might as well use that. But, you know, call an audible and be and not and not even be too apologetic about it, because you know what? There's a lot of events that, you know, you can easily say no to. And the ones that you really want to go to and can't get to that, you know, it's unfortunate, but there's also other ways, you know, you can, you can connect via um, FaceTime or Zoom with people at the event that maybe you're missing, especially if it's like a family event or something, you know, um, I think that there's, you know, in, in this day and age, there's so many uh, ways to work around it. Somebody just asked, uh, can you describe how your role as a caretaker has evolved through your journey? Um, who wants to hit on that one first? That's a good question. Uh, it's still evolving. That's the thing. Yeah. Um, <laughs> um, sure. it, it, the, the, you know, I started off my, I started off um, the, on this, this, um, are, what are we supposed to call it now, Connie? Oh, just, I don't know. Just some people don't like journey. It is a journey. I mean, life is a journey. Come on. Yeah. It, so going. anyway, I call it the journey, but anyway, um, trying to fix it and, and trying to fix the problem, trying to fix the this, everything, and you know, learned that you can't fix it. I think that that was, I think um, one of our uh, speakers today mentioned that, and um, it it's just it continues to evolve. Right now, we're going through um, anxiety and things like that, um, areas that that um, you know, it's just like, oh my gosh, what did I do? Um, <laughs> Uh, the anxiety that you know it's the um it's like the the um the iceberg where you don't see everything down below the water right. and uh everything that you don't that that isn't part of the visible parts of parkinson's right now we're looking at uh educating the close members of our team that don't understand all of those things because you know um I, as we talked in the last in our last monthly meetup i my daughter and her family has invited me to go with them on a trip to Hawaii in December. And, um, and that has created a whole lot of anxiety. And um, my wife, she finally said, well, yeah, go ahead and go. And then I said, cool. I, I felt that relax. I felt relaxed enough that, that we made the plans. And then the anxiety just erupted. And um, so we we able we were able to make new plans and pivot and and um, but anxiety in you or anxiety and uh, anxiety in her in her okay in her the, that's the Parkinson's anxiety yeah, that that yeah. was talked about today it was that's why I was on the edge of my seat when they were talking about when she was talking about anxiety and and taking care of yourself and taking care of um your 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 person with Parkinson's and and that that it's a it's a real thing and. Yeah. Uh, that's part of my evolving right now. Yeah, I think too that, um, yeah, and we're not gonna, I guess we're not gonna do a survey, but um, I'm gonna guess since we asked this at the start, you know, so many of the people that were signing on today, many of you were first timers to the Victory Summit and to this format, but many of you have been living with Parkinson's, uh, a person with Parkinson's for a very long time. And 
uh, I would encourage when you talk about the journey or your role, I think one of the things that Davis and I have realized is that's helpful is sometimes you just gotta, you gotta call for a reset, you gotta hit that reset button. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you might have dug a little bit of a hole, hole for yourself, whether it's an anxiety hole <laughs> or, uh, you know, apathy hole or, you know, wh whatever, give yourself permission to just sort of put that behind you um, and with your person with Parkinson's and just really have those important conversations around, you know, this is hard. It's, I know it's hard for you and, and I, I don't know what it feels like to be you. I say that a lot to uh -huh. Um, Davis, you know, I don't know what it feels like to be you. Um, and I know a lot of times there's um, the, your person with Parkinson's actually, while they're not feeling very good themselves, they're also feeling not so good about what they've brought to your life. <laughs> and so it's important to talk about that, to acknowledge that, you know, yeah, this is hard. It's not what I thought, um, but it's, and, and here's how I think we can make it better you know, when you learn something new or you want to try something new is to use that um, kind of phraseology to get started on, you know, maybe a fresh uh, track because the Parkinson's does change. And that's why when I wrote the little pamphlet, the handout, it was called rewriting the rule book because I felt like the rules are changing so fast, you know? Um, let me give one example, Gail, and then I'll throw it to you is, um, mm the Olympics have changed so much because of COVID this last year in Tokyo and now going winter Olympics are in Beijing. And I just got the, um, I, I follow all the kind of tangential stuff that goes on in, within the Olympic movement. And I got their updated uh, playbook. And I love that because it's a playbook around how the athletes are gonna be dealt with in terms of COVID and you know, what the rules are and you know, how to best prepare and how they're gonna do the distancing and all that stuff. But it's like, we need that too, right? We need updated playbooks, like kind of regularly. And so, um, so I would encourage all of you, if you haven't thought in those terms, the terms of, you know, I need to write down my thoughts, like what's working. I think that came up today is talk about what's working, but talk about what's not working. And you know what, let's not do this anymore. Let's not have these arguments that are going to trigger your symptoms because then I feel guilty. And then you feel guilty that I feel guilty. You know, it's just this, Vicious circle, right? So, um, Gail, what do you got? You were going to add something to that. Well, you're talking about the journey. So, I, I first it was the journey. First part of my journey was not quite understanding what was going on. So that was just confusion. When my husband was diagnosed, then there was denial that came into the picture. As his, and I didn't really want to share it with anyone. I asked him not to tell anyone and I didn't want to tell anyone because I was in denial, figuring I can hide mm -hmm. his symptoms. That was a job for me to hide his symptoms. So I gave myself a job right then and there. Then as that progressed, I had the journey of him telling me, Gail, you don't, you have to understand, I'm not doing this on purpose. I'm not being slow, getting ready or I'm not sitting at the table staring when there are things to be done. So I had to begin to understand that. At first, I refused to read anything about Parkinson's because there aren't too many happy in <laughs> examples of Parkinson's. So I thought I would stop reading about it. But of course, as things progressed, I then realized it's very important to me to understand so that I can be more tolerant of the things that are irritating me and, and, and understanding it. So I went from denying to then getting involved and reading it. And then of course, as, the, as my husband became worse and worse, I, th I then became a, a caregiver. And then I did a lot of reading. Then I really jumped into it with the, with the Davis Finney Foundation, everything like that. So I could, I could actually e empathize with him um, you know, there was a whole empathy and sympathy, but, uh, and I'm really understanding, which made it easier for me because I didn't take things personally. And also I didn't, I stopped trying to control his disease. I went with it and realized that things are going to happen and there's no, I, and I can't control it. So I gave myself that, that, uh, that, that, um, ability to 
throw away the guilt and just do the best job that I can do. So that was my journey. Yeah. Huh. I, I think that's a good point too. Like you, we do go through, I think the, some of the stages that the newly diagnosed go through, right? Like confusion, denial, <laughs> resistance. Um, I would say too, and I meant to say this during my talk earlier is that one of the best things you can do for yourself is to avoid negativity uh, around you. And, and that would be like watching the news or don't watch the news, <laughs> you know, don't keep your TV on all day to, you know, a news channel that is really only designed to bring you the bad news, you know, and, um, you know, change your point of view to, so that you can keep yourself more upbeat, because I think that's a big part of um, grappling and dealing with this successfully. I'd also like to throw out there, um, Pat, you actually changed jobs in order to yeah. better accommodate um, your person with Parkinson's. You, yes. Would you like to talk about that a little? Because I think that's another interesting um, aspect. And again, you know, m many people on the call are maybe past their prime work years, but you, you did a pivot fairly late in your life to, to, to make your family situation work. Yeah. To, to say the least, um, I, I actually was in a, uh, I had a career in advertising and radio and television and, uh, in for, well, for, for a long time, 30 years about. And, uh, when Parkinson's came, I knew, uh, we knew that something had to change because of the stress that I would bring home. You know, you're only as good as your last sale. And, and sometimes I bring that home and I'm, I bring work home and, and, uh, and that was needing, we needed to make a change on that because of the stress, because of the negativity or what have you that might be coming around uh, with that. And so we started looking at it and eventually what I, uh, I did is I went back to school. I, I was well into my fifties um, and I went back to school got a, I have a, um, I now have a, um, a master's degree in, in special education and I'm a special education teacher at a high school here in Las Vegas and um, I'm loving it. And it also gives us, uh, um, it, it provides us, uh, you know, it still has its stresses, but um, it provides us with the opportunity, number one, to have the, the benefit of, of, uh, of, of a, a decent uh, insurance program um, which is important. And, um, the other things is, is that it uh, allows for our schedule to, to take time in the summers, um, to take time to get out of the, we're, we're in the middle of the desert. And I don't know if you, um, if your person with Parkinson's likes the heat, mine doesn't. And, uh, and so we, we get out and go up to Colorado and we actually, we, we ride our bikes all over the place, but uh, yeah, that's just really how it's evolved. And, and um, but changing that job was, was a big deal. I'm now six years, I'm in my sixth year of teaching and um, I'm the young, I'm the oldest, I'm the oldest teacher with the youngest uh, amount of years, <laughs> yeah. the, the least experience. The in, least in, experience, in, yeah. yeah. But I think it's also just like everything that we do as a care partner with our person or around, you know, life choices like this with and for our person with um, Parkinson's affects us. And we need to, um, you know, really assess how we're living. Uh, Davis and I downsized pretty early into a, a single floor um, condominium with a wonderful view, which is where he takes his sunset shots from. <laughs> and uh you know, it's really served us well. Um, it's it's not for everyone, you know, and, and I know um, Amber, the occupational therapist was talking about, you know, the, trying to get your person with Parkinson's up and downstairs. You know, there's, there's several places in the home that, that become pretty um, un unhealthy for your person with Parkinson's and stairs can be one of them, and if it, especially frequently, and especially if they're running late and they're trying to come down the stairs fast. One time Davis came down the stairs on his back as if he was riding a sled because he was wearing his some ski boots or something and they slipped out. And we had a friend waiting 
at the in at the front door and and I was just like oh my god but you know he turned it into like a smiley moment as if he'd done it on purpose as if he was a one man you know it was illusion <laughs> but you know fortunately he didn't get injured but you know that was like I was just going oh my god we got to get out of this place <laughs> because you know he had just run up for something that he'd forgotten and then you know in his in his hurry and being in boots that he would normally not be wearing in the house um fell and you know falling is is difficult um we we talked a little bit um earlier today too about um uh, what was one of the topics on the the um ot i was thinking of, oh one thing that wasn't included i wanted to mention was talking about driving irene have you concerned about your person with parkinson's driving yeah, everyone. <laughs> yeah. So I, I just wanted to add that the occupational therapist can also uh, sometimes either direct you to or help you with an assessment um, for driving. And yes, the best choice is not to drive, but if they are going to drive, they need to stay in practice driving. And that's another um, great point that uh, Susan Imke, uh, who was meant to be among us uh, today, also would talk about with her husband. Um, you know, that when you decide that it's not safe and they don't, or they drive very, very, very infrequently, you want to remember that um, they do need to practice. And so uh, infrequently is not good. It's better just to not drive <laughs> at all if there's a concern. Um, and that's hard. It's really hard. Yeah. And a couple of people are saying their person doesn't drive or decided not to drive. And I think that's that's um, it's a rough one. It's hard with elderly parents, even if they've been healthy their whole life, right? When when they should stop driving, and there's nothing worse for your body than a car accident. Uh, so much better to avoid that if possible. Um, Honey, we had a question I think right at the beginning from Allison. She asked, "So often when I plan an activity with my husband, at the last minute he doesn't want to participate. How can I best handle these situations?" Uh, he doesn't want to participate. So you've, you've made a plan and he wants to change the plan, basically. Right. I feel like he, um, <clears throat> it might be that he's not feeling well, but I don't take it that way. I take it that he's just doesn't want to do it and it hurts my feelings. And um, I, it, I feel like he's just trying to not go along with what we thought we would do. Yeah, that must be frustrating. And um, I think, yes. yeah. <laughs> and I think we've all probably experienced that on some level. And I think that's where, and so at the moment that they decide not to go is a hard moment to then have a careful, calm conversation around it, right? <laughs> right. And so, so, so you know, let me let me use an, an analogy that that I would say when when my daughter was young, and she was in um, like middle school, let's say, and even grade school, she would ask, she would she would go to a friend's house for dinner. They'd be playing, and it would lead to dinner, and then she'd call and she'd say, "Can I sleep over?" And one of the number one rules in the house was there was no uh, unplanned. There were no unplanned sleepovers. So once we, you know, if she would have asked me a few days before and I could have talked to the parents and we had it set up, then we might have done that. In this case, with you, with, with Parkinson's, can you see the link here? It's like, you need to have a rule between you that says, um, you don't get to change the plans, <laughs> you know, especially about something that's near and dear to me, unless it's an emergency. And I'm only going to give you like so many like little cards, like you can make some little cards up like Monopoly, you know, the get out of jail free card. This could be the, uh, you know, you don't have to go card. <laughs> or I'm going to get someone to come here and stay with you while I go card. But I, I think that this leads to that bigger question of communication. And then also the bigger question of who's on your team that you can get to support you. And especially if it's an event that's important to you, if it was, you know, your family get together, if it was your friends and you want to still go, you need to be able to have an option, right. To, to, to still go. And that's where um, you have, that's where you just need this either a bigger team or, you know, some good rules around that because 
nobody likes the surprise. And, and even though we all have to agree that that does happen, um, I think if you started to have that conversation when it wasn't um, go time, <laughs> it would be it would be most effective. Pat or Gail, do you have anything on that? No, it's tough. It's really tough. You know, you you plan these things. This is for your for your mental health, your physical health. And not only don't you get a chance to go, but then you have more stress because of the situation. It's it's difficult. I, Connie, your suggestion is is good. I I can't imagine other than um, what, whatever condition. I mean, if, you, if Parkinson's patient is in pretty good condition, then you just say, "Here's your dinner. Help yourself. I'm going." But that that depends on what what condition they're in, of course. Right. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I I um I try to keep an open mind. Um, if if they're if she doesn't want to end up not wanting to go to something that we have planned to go, if if I if I don't really care to go, you know, if if it doesn't if it's not going to affect me either way. I mean, if it's not a planned thing where it's something that I'm really looking forward to, then we can you know we talk and everything. But I, I like I I was asked if I'm going to Hawaii. I I am going to Hawaii, and she is going on a trip of her own to her sister's house. So um, we're, we're, we've got it all worked out that way, but, um, but it could, you know, you never know, it could still change, but um, yeah, keeping an open mind and, and being willing to um, give and take. And, um, but uh, you do need to take care of yourself. And if it's something that's really planned for, for sure. I mean, there, there's your dinner, I'll be back. Richard looks like he has a question. Yeah, Richard. Um, actually, I'd like to make a contribution. Hi. Oh. Hi, I'm Richard Adler. My friend Gail, who's been wonderful to me, has been keeping me alive for a long time. My wife's in her 17th year. I just sent a chat on a completely different subject. I want to make a contribution. Um, I'm a lawyer for 54 years, former prosecutor, and I specialize in traffic law. Mm. I have had many friends and relatives and referrals who ask me, what do I do about somebody who shouldn't be driving? They won't quit. You are playing with fire. Yeah. Somebody could get killed. Somebody could get maimed. Your loved ones could be injured permanent, in more permanent ways than you know. Number one, try to find somebody they trust and make a limited contract with them. Maybe for three months, five months, where they won't drive. And then it's a renewable contract and have both of you sign it, excuse me, and, and have both of you sign it so that you're both responsible to each other. And I find- Hey, Richard. Help. Go ahead, Connie, I'm sorry. Yeah, Richard, let me, let me add to that. So interestingly, um, in our case, and I just like to share that because I do agree with you that if you um, feel your person with Parkinson's is unsafe, um, it, it's a tough call, but, you need to help them to stop driving. And I think a contract between you might work, but we also, we, we paid money to be evaluated, to have Davis evaluated by um, an occupational therapist uh, who does this uh, for elderly people and people that have challenges like Parkinson's. And she and Davis made a contract. And that was that Davis wouldn't drive after dark and he wouldn't drive in unfamiliar places because she could see where that would cause problems. He doesn't have trouble driving in his town. We live in the town he was born and raised in. He doesn't have trouble driving to the airport and back um, because it's a simple you know, drive. And, and so that would, to me was a fantastic suggestion uh, because I think driving in unfamiliar places is hard for all of us, <laughs> much less a person with Parkinson's. So, and, and I was told, uh, Richard, at one of our talks um, by someone a similar, with similar experience to yours, that, um, that having, having, getting your person tested and, and, then ha and, and, and an approval for that will actually be uh, a form of defense if your person gets in. Um, you're shaking your head, Richard, is that wrong? I, 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 there are two ways. First of all, I love what you did with it. I I just learned that my wife, through you, Connie, and the program, uh, is suffering from some dementia after 17 years. Now she's in a wheelchair for the last two. Mm. And I didn't realize the dementia. It's cognitive patterning, but it's also responsiveness to patterns. These could be traffic lights in your, in your scenario, 
or it could be at home, not even being able to sort suites and numbers of decks and of decks of cards. So the reason I'm mentioning this is um, uh, if you can find a way, there's two ways to do this. Number one, you can write to your licensing issue body in the state, usually called a DMV, Department of Motor Vehicles. Uh, they, in our area, it says Illinois Secretary of State, whoever issues a license and write and ask, say that this person anonymously, say this person's unsafe, they'll cancel the license, take the burden off of you to taking away your loved one's privileges and have it um, resolved that way anonymously. And then a doctor has to write a written approval for that license to get back reviewed by a medical board at the DMV. They have a professional board that does this all the time. Oh, well. I think it's probably state by state, right? Let's move well, on. Every uh, state has this. Okay. Every state. Because oh, I do all 48 states remarkably. Okay. The second okay. thing that you mentioned, uh, <laughs> my father-in-law took the test. I drove him there because I didn't feel safe with him driving. This is years <laughs> ago. We got to the DMV. They took him around. I waited. They came back. I said, how'd you do? Figuring he failed and I'm off the hook. He said, I passed. I said, oh God, very congratulations. Give me the key to the car. Where did you park? He said, I have no idea. <laughs> he had no idea where he had just parked his car with the person who tested him. That tells you about cognitive patterning. And he had the beginnings of dementia. I'm sorry, I'll stay out from now. Yeah, let's jump topics. But thank you so much for that because That's I think awesome. uh, I think it is an important topic and we didn't cover it. We didn't yeah. talk about it today. So uh, what else do we have? We have a long, is this a question from Darlene, Jackie? What is a okay. Darlene, did you have a question associated with your with your comment or just contributing? Yeah, um, my, my husband has become, um, it is a question and it's about me. Uh, he He doesn't take, very much medication, just carbidopa, levodopa, but he's become convinced that his worsening symptoms in the evening come from more and more medication. And so he keeps wanting to reduce his medication and his symptoms keep getting worse and worse. And so I'm watching him suffer. My caregiver burden is increasing and we've had numerous conversations about this, but he's convinced that his worsening symptoms in the evenings come from his medication and he wants to reduce it and reduce it and reduce it. Mm. Um, he keeps saying, I keep saying, well, are you willing to try whether more medication helps? And he's like, well, I'll try it maybe sometime, but then he never does. Yeah. Okay, listen. Because it, it doesn't make sense to him on some level. And I have no idea, is this cognitive decline? What's, you know, what's going on here? I don't think that the carbidopa levodopa is causing worsening symptoms. I think it's disease progression. Sure, it could be a combination, but I, but you know, you're not in a position to make that determination kind of, but, but you're seeing it, right? And so you want to know, is this normal? Or well, is... here's, here's the caregiver problem too. In his doctor's appointments, he's far more functional than at home. Um, so so our, our doctors follow, our doctor tends, is young and tends to follow his lead is what I'm seeing so far. So okay. as, a care, as a care partner, how do I, I, I just, I'm, I'm, I'm at a loss. Okay, Darlene, are you seeing a movement disorder specialist? Yes, or movement okay. disorder specialist. Okay, yes. that's good. So I think what you want to do is communicate with the doctor's office uh, privately. Are you able to do that? Do you have the HIPAA release forms? I don't know. Okay, so um, you, I have not tried to do that before, so I could Darlene, try let that. Me, let me make a suggestion, and that is you call the doctor's office and ask them, what do you need um, from right. them to sign on? So, he, he probably has to sign it to, to say that you can speak to the doctor. And I, I think every caregiver on this chat right here, and I've said it many times, should have uh, a HIPAA release form signed for all care for their person with Parkinson's so that, they, that you can be an informed member of the team. And doctors do know that people show up in the, in the office, people with Parkinson's, doing their best. And very often they ask people to come, you know, make the appointment at a time of day when they're not doing their best. So I would encourage you the next time that you do see your doctor, which I know it always takes months to do this, but 
schedule it for late in the day. Well, that's, that's good. That, that would be seven, eight o'clock at night, which is not when doctors have appointments, but yeah, basically but schedule it as late as you can okay. and, and maybe ask him to go to the appointment unmedicated uh, or ask your doctor to ask him to go to the appointment unmedicated because they need to see what you're talking about to help you manage it. He's not capable of managing himself. Um, if what you're, if he's experiencing worsening symptoms and more discomfort, then he's not going to sleep as well. And, you know, executive function is, you know, decision-making function is highly um, affected by Parkinson's and by fatigue. <laughs> it does seem to be a spiral. Yeah. There's kind of yeah. a bit of a spiral going on at this point. Yeah. And it's hard for you. And because it's hard for you, uh, uh, it needs to be remedied. Okay. And it could be that when you do take more meds, you sometimes get more dyskinesia and, and the, you know, when you're and more of the on off cycle um, variations, um, Pat or Gail, do you have anything to add to that? Or, or do you He's had no dyskinesia for, for several years. He's just, he never takes enough medication to get to that threshold of dyskinesia. How old is he? 63. Oh, 63. Okay. Uh, diagnosed seven years ago. So he's, he's still relatively functional, but, um, you know, it's, it's just, it's tough. Like well, see, if he can't, if he can't button his shirt and he needs me to button his shirt and what he really needs is adjusted medications. I just like, how, how bad does this have to get before he realizes? Yeah. Well, they do have, they do have shirts that with magnets on. on yeah. Oh yeah. Well, we'll, we'll get to those eventually. I'm, I'm, I'm well aware. I just um, hoping we can delay that a few more. I mean, I read, I read your comment a while ago and the, and where I got, where the red flag came up for me was where you say the doctor is somewhat passive and follows, you know, his lead and so forth. And, and I, 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 I can empathize with that. Um, I've experienced that in a lot of medical settings. You know, we went to occupational therapist and, and she's like, show me how you put your jacket on. And he puts it on one sleeve after the other at no, home. I, no, I, I, never. I and she was like, Oh, okay. And, and, you know, i not to be pessimistic or anything, but at home it's like, Oh, my second sleeve. I can't do it. Can't do it. And I'm walking over and, you know, helping him and it's no big deal, but, well, but why can he do that in the doctor's office and not at home? Yeah, the, okay, the, listen up. Um, I hate to say this, but I guess we're we're at the time uh, where we need to wrap this up. Huh. I, um, uh, Jackie's saying, yeah, we we we're just getting to some good questions, and I'm sorry about that. But I do think um, many of you come. Yeah, thank you, Darlene, for asking that. That's an important question, and um, if you, I'd love to hear what happens. <laughs> I hope you get success yeah. uh, with that have some success. I know it's hard. And your husband's actually in the age range of someone who, you know, is still experimenting because, you know, I mean, we have to honor the person with Parkinson's feeling around taking their medications. But when we can see that it's not working, um, it's very frustrating. And there are, there are options. And I call it being undermanaged when you have, especially it's a long period of time. So you need where he's uncomfortable. So let's hope you can find better management. Um, and I, I just so appreciate everyone showing up and, and, you know, just being here for us and for your person with Parkinson's. It's, it's so important. There's a couple of things that, that I uh, was wanting to just close with and, and didn't say earlier, even in mine, uh, been listening to a lot of Brene Brown and, and she talks about, you know, a lot about believing in yourself. And so I hope you can maybe find some of those resources to listen to. Um, Gail always articulates so beautifully how each of us is doing our best. Oh, there you go. Yeah, showing a book. Yep, very good. Is that a Brene Brown book? I can't actually see it, but, um, but, but we're, we're doing our best. And if you look for confirmation that you're not good at something, you'll definitely find it. But if you look for confirmation that you're good at something, you'll also definitely find it. So let's go down that route. Again, that's just this cultivating a little bit more optimism and that will help you to co cultivate joy and then dig into those wonderful moments of awe. And I think that's uh, where I'd like to leave it today with, with all of you and hope that some of this will trickle out and, and, and help you go forward and live a rich life.